Hello everyone and welcome to today's video with Teacher Gia. We've got an exciting and information packed session ahead. Whether you're a first time visitor or one of our dedicated subscribers, your presence here means the world to us. Today, we'll be delving into the fascinating world of data organization, a crucial aspect of any research journey. We'll be covering several subtopics that will help you navigate this intricate terrain with confidence. First, we'll explore the essential process of data pre-processing, where raw data is transformed into usable and meaningful information. Next, we'll dive into the development of a coding scheme, an indispensable tool for categorizing and analyzing data effectively. Then, we'll discuss the pivotal decision of choosing the right data storage method. We'll compare the advantages of paper storage, which is low-cost and comprehensible, with electronic storage, which offers flexibility and ease of distribution. And lastly, we'll help you navigate the world of statistical software packages. We'll consider the characteristics of the data you're working with, the analysis you need to perform, and any technical or financial constraints you may face when selecting the most suitable software package. So stay tuned as we embark on this enlightening journey through the intricacies of data organization. Let's get started. We're going to start with pre-processing. In research data organization, pre-processing plays a vital role in ensuring that the data collected is of high quality and suitable for analysis. Addressing issues such as the elimination of unusable data, interpretation of ambiguous answers, and handling contradictory data from related questions involves several stages, and we're going to start with that. We have six stages and I'm going to tackle each and every stage and explain at length. The first one is data cleaning. Under data cleaning, we're talking about elimination of unusable data. Start by identifying and removing data that is unusable or irrelevant for your research objectives. This could include duplicate records, data collected from respondents who did not meet the inclusion criteria, or data from incomplete surveys. For example, finding two or more questions providing the same data, one should decide which one is worth coding and storing and which one should be discarded. Under data cleaning, you should also be dealing with missing data by either imputing missing values using appropriate methods, e.g. mean imputation, regression imputation, or excluding cases with substantial missing data. The next stage is interpretation of ambiguous answers. Any complex study is likely to produce at least some ambiguous answers. What you should do here, you should define clear variables. Ensure that survey questions and data collection instruments are well defined and unambiguous. Ambiguity in questions can lead to varied interpretations by respondents. Another thing is documentation. Document any instances where respondents' answers were unclear or ambiguous. This documentation can be valuable when interpreting or analyzing the data. Follow up questions. If possible, follow, include follow up questions or probes to clarify ambiguous responses during the data collection process. We move to the third stage, which is handling contradictory data. Data validation rules, that's what we're talking about. Implement validation rules during data collection to minimize contradictory responses. For example, if a respondent's age is provided as 10 years, but their birth date indicates they're 20 years old, this could be flagged as contradictory. Consistency checks. Conduct consistency checks during data entry and cleaning to identify and resolve contradictions. For instance, ensure that responses to related questions such as income and household size are logically consistent. Data transformation. In some cases, contradictory data may require transformation or recording to bring it to, into a consistent format. For example, if a survey includes income brackets and exact income values, you may choose to convert all responses to a single format for analysis. 
we move to the fourth stage, which is data documentation and transparency. Maintain clear and comprehensive documentation of the entire data pre-processing process, including the elimination of unusable data, handling of ambiguous answers, and resolution of contradictory data. Document any assumptions or decisions made during data processing as this can affect the interpretation of results. The fifth stage is quality control and validation. Establish a quality control process to review the data for errors, inconsistencies, and contradictions. This may involve independent data checks by multiple team members. Validate the data against the research objective to ensure that it's accurately, it accurately reflects the phenomena under investigation. Communication with respondents. If feasible, consider reaching out to respondents to clarify ambiguous or contradictory responses. This can help ensure the accuracy of the data. Data preprocessing in research is essential for ensuring the reliability and validity of the data. By addressing issues such as unusable data, ambiguous answers, and contradictory data, researchers can provide high quality data sets that form the foundation of meaningful analysis and research outcomes. So that is the first part, which is pre-processing under data organization. We move to the second part, which is the development of a coding scheme. So after you've done the pre-processing, you move to developing a coding scheme. A coding scheme in the context of research and data analysis is a systematic and structured framework used to categorize and label data based on specific criteria, themes, concepts, and attributes. It's a methodological tool employed primarily in qualitative research to organize and make sense of textual or qualitative data such as interviews, surveys, observations, and documents. The purpose of a coding scheme is to facilitate the analysis of qualitative data by breaking it down into manageable components that can be analyzed and interpreted. So here is what a coding scheme typically includes. First, it includes code categories. These are the main labels or categories that represent different aspects, themes, or concepts within the data. Each category is assigned a unique code or an identifier. Code definitions have clear and concise descriptions or definitions of each code category. These definitions explain what each code represents and provide guidance on when to apply it. Coding instructions, detailed instructions or guidelines that help researchers or coders understand how to apply the codes accurately and, and consistently. This may include examples or criteria for code application. Next is a code book, which is a reference document that compiles all the information related to the coding scheme, including code categories, definitions, and instructions. The code book serves as a central resource for anyone involved in the coding process. Coding process, the actual process of applying is the actual process of applying the codes to the data. Researchers or coders through read through their data, identify relevant segments, and assign the appropriate codes to these segments. We have software tools. Many researchers use specialized qualitative data analysis software, I've sampled the two, to assist in the coding process. These tools allow for efficient coding, data management, and retrieval of coded segments. And lastly, we are at the data organization, where the coded data is often organized in a structured format, such as a database or a spreadsheet, where each entry corresponds to a coded segment of the data. This structured data makes it easier to analyze and retrieve information. The coding scheme essentially acts as a bridge between the raw qualitative data and the final analytical results. Researchers use the coding scheme to break down the data into meaningful categories, identify patterns, themes, and relationships within the data, and ultimately draw conclusions or make interpretations based on the coded data. Coding schemes can vary widely depending on the research objectives and the nature of the data being analyzed. They are a fundamental tool in qualitative research, enabling researchers to transform 
complex sexual information into a format that can be systematically analyzed and used to answer research questions or generate insights. So next, we, go, we will be talking about steps to develop a coding scheme. The first one, you should define your research objectives. Clearly outline your research goals, questions, or hypotheses. Understanding what you aim to achieve with your data analysis is essential for developing a relevant coding scheme. Next is data familiarization. Thoroughly review the data you have collected. This could include transcripts of interviews, survey responses, observational notes, or any other qualitative data sources. Familiarization with the data helps you gain insights into the context and con content and context. Identify key concepts. Identify the key concepts, themes, or variables that are relevant to your research objectives. These are the elements you will code for in your data. Create code categories. Based on the key concepts, create a list of initial code categories. These categories should represent in the different aspects or dimensions of your data that you want to analyze. Code definitions. Develop a clear and concise definition for each code category. These definitions should de describe what each code represents and when it should be applied. Pilot testing. So not to forget, I have a video talking about pilot testing and everything can check it out. So pilot testing, before applying the coding scheme to the entire data set, conduct a pilot test on a small portion of your data. This helps ensure the that the codes are clear, consistent, and carry and can be reliably <coughs> applied by different coders if applicable. Refinement and iteration. Based on the results of the pilot test, refine the coding scheme as needed. This may involve modifying code definitions, adding or removing categories or clarifying instructions. Code book development. Create a code book that serves as a reference document for your coding scheme. Include the code categories, definitions, and any examples or guidelines to help coders apply the scheme consistently. Training coders if applicable. If you have a team of coders, provide them with training on the coding scheme and code book. Ensure they understand the definitions and coding guidelines. Coding the data. Apply the coding scheme to your entire data set systematically. Each piece of data, e.g. a sentence, an interview excerpt, a survey response, should be assigned one or more relevant codes based on the content. Quality control. Implement quality control measures to ensure consistency in coding. This may involve regular meetings with coders to discuss any questions or ambiguities and reviewing a subset of coded data for reliability. Data management. Organize the coded data in a structured format. You may use software tools specifically designed for qualitative data analysis, such as Z2, to assist in data management and retrieval. Data analysis. Once the data is coded, you can analyze it using various qualitative analysis techniques, such as content analysis, thematic analysis, or grounded theory. Interpretation. And reporting the final part interpret the findings based on the coded data and report your research results in a way that aligns with your research objectives and questions so developing a coding scheme is an iterative process that requires careful planning and attention to detail a well-designed coding scheme ensures that the qualitative data is organized in a way that facilitates meaningful analysis and contributes to the achievement of your research goals with teacher Gia, there's always an example. So here's an example of a coding scheme. Let's walk through the development of a coding scheme for a qualitative research project using a hypothetical example related to understanding customer feedback for a restaurant. So this example is going to be based on the steps or stages in developing a coding scheme. So the first step we had talked about is data collection. So Using this ob research objective, you should gather customer feedback in the form of written comments from customer surveys. Then the next step was data familiarization. Review. So here we're going to review the collected customer comments to understand their context and con content and context. Wow. Uh, the third stage is identify key concepts. 
key concepts here in our you know using our research objective is gonna be food quality service speed cleanliness staff attitude and pricing so then we're gonna create card categories card categories here we're gonna have food quality service speed cleanliness staff attitude and pricing then we're gonna do with the card definitions Card definitions, the food quality, comments related to the taste, freshness, and presentation of food, service speed, comments about the time it took to receive orders or food, cleanliness, comments regarding the cleanliness of the restaurant, including tables, restrooms, and overall hygiene, staff attitude, feedback on the behavior and demeanor of restaurant staff, pricing, Comments about the cost of food and whether it is perceived as reasonable. Then pilot testing. Here, we're going to apply the coding scheme to a subset of customer comments to test its effectiveness and make necessary adjustment. Next is refinement and iteration. Based on the pilot test, refine the coding scheme and code definitions as needed. Then code book development. Create a code book that involves all code categories, definitions, and examples of examples for reference. Then training coders if applicable. If multiple coders are involved, provide training on the coding scheme and code book. Then coding the data. Apply the coding scheme to all customer comments. For example, a comment like the food tasted amazing, but it was a bit pricey would be coded as both food quality and pricing. Quality control. Conduct regular meetings with coders to ensure consistency in coding and resolve any questions and ambiguities. Data management. Organize the coded data in a structured format, such as a spreadsheet, where each comment is labeled with the appropriate codes. Data analysis. Analyze the coded data to identify common themes. You might find that a significant number of comments are related to service speed. Interpretation and reporting. Interpret the findings based on the coded data. For example, we may conclude that improving service speed should be a priority for the restaurant based on the frequency of related comments. In this example, the coding scheme helps researchers systematically categorize and analyze customer comments, leading to insights about about areas of improvement for the restaurant service. The coding process bridges the gap between raw qualitative data, uh, the customer comments, and research findings that can inform decision making and improvements in the restaurant's operations. Next, we're going to move to a critical matter. And this is a major challenge that is associated with coding, and it is the treatment of missing data. Uh, when a question is unanswered or an essential question was not asked, should researchers ignore the question or change and interpret it? Handling missing data is qualitative. In qualitative research, coding can be a significant challenge, but it's essential to address it thoughtfully to ensure the integrity of your analysis. The approach you choose should depend on the nature of, it, of the missing data, your research objectives, and the context of your study. Here are the several possible approaches that a researcher can apply to address these challenges. First, explain missing data. In your code book or coding guidelines, explain how to handle missing data when encountered. Clearly define what should be done when a respondent doesn't answer a specific question or when a question was not asked. For instance, you might instruct coders to not missing responses and move on to the next relevant section. Cross-reference. If possible, cross-reference the missing data with other parts of the data or responses from the same respondent. This can help create context and potentially infer the missing information. For example, if a respondent mentions the restaurant's food but does not provide a rating, you can infer the opinion from their other comments. This option is less available if the researcher has carefully minimized duplication between questions. So you can only do that if applicable. Inter interpolate from other answers. 
If a respondent has provided similar information in other parts of the survey or interview, you may interpolate or infer their response for the missing question based on the patterns of answers. However, exercise caution and ensure that such interpolation is reasonable and justifiable. Look to see how other respondents of the same type answer this question. Now, also, you can analyze data distribution. Examine the distribution of responses for the question with missing data. If there is a clear pattern or trend in the data, you may use this information to estimate or input the missing value. Be cautious not to make assumptions that are not supported by the available data. Give missing data its own code. Create a specific code category or label for missing data, e.g. did not answer. To indicate that a response was not provided or a question was skipped. This allows you to track the frequency of missing data and consider its impact on your analysis. This is the most common and safest approach. Ex you can also exclude the respondent from analysis. In some cases, if a respondent has missing multiple has multiple missing responses or crucial information is missing, you may choose to exclude the respondent from the analysis for that particular research question. However, this should be done judiciously and you should clearly document the criteria for exclusion. Also, you can exclude the question from analysis. If a particular question is missing responses from a particular number of respondents, for example, or if it was not asked to a substantial number of respondents, you may consider excluding that question from the analysis. This decision should be based on the research objectives and the importance of the question. So, when addressing missing data, transparency and consistency in your approach are key. Clearly document how you handled missing data in your code book and report. Additionally, be mindful of the potential biases that can arise from missing data and how you chosen how your chosen approach may impact the validity of your research findings. In cases where missing data is extensive, you may also consider sensitivity analysis to assess the potential impact of different handling methods on your results. So, just to remind ourselves, we are talking about data organization, we have talked about pre-processing, we have tackled development of the coding scheme, and now we'll move to the third part or rather the third stage which is deciding on data storage. Deciding on data storage and data organization is a critical step in research and data management. The choice of data storage method and infrastructure should align with your research objectives, data volume, accessibility needs, security requirements, and budget constraints. Here are some considerations to help you decide on data storage. So the first one is data types. Determine the types of data you'll be working with. Are you dealing with structured data, e.g. numerical or text, and structured data, e.g. documents or images, or a combination of both? Different data types may require different storage solutions. Data volume. Estimate the volume of data you'll be collecting and working with. Consider not only the current data set size but also potential growth over time ensure your chosen storage can handle the expected data volume accessibility and collaboration think about who needs access to the data will multiple researchers or team members be working with the data simultaneously collaborative research may require shared storage solutions and access access controls Next is data security and compliance. Assess the sensitivity of your data and any legal or regulatory requirements regarding data security and privacy. Ensure that your chosen storage method complies with these requirements. Backup uh, and disaster recovery. Implement robust backup and disaster recovery procedures to prevent data loss in case of hardware failure, data corruption, or other unforeseen events. Consider regular backups to secure data integrity. Scalability. Choose a storage solution that can scale to accommodate future data growth. Scalability is crucial if your research project is expected to generate large volumes of data over time. Access speed and performance. Consider the speed and performance requirements for accessing 
and retrieving data. Faster storage solutions may be necessary for real-time data analysis or applications with high input or output demands. Budget constraints. Evaluate your budget and the costs associated with different storage options. Cloud-based storage solutions, for example, may offer flexibility but come with ongoing costs. Data organization and structure. Plan how you will organize and structure your data within the storage system. A well-organized data hierarchy and file naming conventions can enhance data management and retrieval. Data retrieval and search. Think about how you will search and retrieve data from storage. Some storage solutions offer advanced search capabilities or metadata tagging, which can aid in data retrieval. Data lifespan and retention. Determine how long you will need to retain the data. Different storage options may be suitable for short-time storage, long-term archiving, or a combination of both. Data access control. I'm really having a problem with access and access. Implement access control mechanisms to restrict access to sensitive data based on user roles and permissions. This is particularly important for protecting confidential or proprietary information. So there are two major storage forms. We have paper storage and electronic storage, which represent the two major forms I'm talking about, each with its own characteristics, advantages, and limitations. Let's explore these two storage forms in more detail. So paper storage, it refers to the physical storage of data on paper documents or records. It has been used for centuries and remains in use today, particularly for certain types of documents and research. So there are advantages of paper storage, uh, low cost. One of the most significant advantages of paper storage is its affordability. Paper documents are relatively inexpensive to produce and store compared to electronic alternatives that require infrastructure, hardware, and software investments. Allow speedy retrieval. For small-scale storage systems, paper documents can be relatively easy to retrieve quickly. In situations where you have a well-organized filing system and know where specific documents are located, retrieval can be rapid. Easy to distribute. Distributing paper documents is straightforward and do not require specialized technology. Documents can be physically handed to individuals, mailed or faxed, without the need of, for digital devices or internet connectivity. Comprehensible. Paper documents are often considered more straightforward and comprehensible than digital documents, particularly for individuals who are not tech savvy. People can read and understand paper documents without the need of digital literacy. Security. Paper documents can be stored securely in locked filing cabinet, filling cabinets or safes, reducing the risk of unauthorized access, durability, Properly stored paper documents can have a long lifespan, especially when kept in controlled environments. So after talking about the advantages, you also have the disadvantages of paper storage. Limited accessibility. Retrieving information from paper documents can be time-consuming, especially when dealing with large volumes of data. Space requirements are, we can say, bulky. Storing paper, storing paper documents requires physical space, and as data accumulates, storage space can become a significant issue and will need additional filling cabinets or space. Vulnerability or the fragile paper documents are susceptible sorry, to physical damage, e.g. fire, water damage, pests, or improper handling, resulting to a loss of valuable information and can deteriorate over time. Paper storage systems ca can become ex increasingly challenging to manage as the volume of data grows. Expanding a paper-based system to accommodate more documents can lead to issues with space constraints and organization. While paper, paper storage has these advantages and disadvantages, it's important to note that many organizations and individuals have transitioned to electrical electronic storage solutions for various reasons, including improved efficiency, reduced environmental impact, and enhanced data security. So from that, we move to the electronic storage. 
Electronic storage involves storing data in digital formats using computers, servers, or cloud-based solutions. It is the predominant form of data storage in the digital age. Advantages Accessibility Electronic data can be easily access, accessed and retrieved using computers or other digital devices, often with powerful search and indexing capabilities. Space Efficiency Electronic storage eliminates the need for, space, for physical space to store documents, make it, making it highly space efficient. Data redundancy and backup. Electronic data can be easily duplicated and backed up, reducing the risk of data loss. Search and organization. Electronic data can be organized, tagged, and categorized for effici efficient retrieval. Extensible. Electronic storage systems can be easily scaled to accommodate growing data volumes. Adding more storage capacity is often as simple as acquiring additional hardware or cloud storage space, making it highly extensible. Easy to distribute. Electronic documents and data can be distributed swiftly through email, file sharing services, or collaboration platforms. This enables efficient sharing of information with individuals or teams, regardless of their physical location. Easy to interchange formats. Electronic files can be converted into various formats easily, making it simple to exchange data with others in their preferred format, e.g. PDF, Word, and Excel. This interchangeability forces compatibility and collaboration. Low volume and space efficient. Electronic data takes up minimal physical space, eliminating the need for bulky filling cabinets or storage rooms. This space efficiency can lead to cost savings, especially in office environments where physical storage space is at a premium. <coughs> also, we're going to tackle disadvantages of electronic storage. Equipment, equipment costs are high. Establishing, implementing, and maintaining electronic storage systems include servers, Including servers, storage devices, and backup solutions can entail significant upfront and ongoing costs. These expenses may be prohibiti prohibitive for small organizations or individuals. Limited access. Electronic storage relies on access to technology and the internet. In the areas with limited connectivity or for individuals without access to digital devices, retrieving and interacting with electronic data can be challenging or impossible. Security concerns are fragile. Electronic data is susceptible to data loss due to hardware failures, software glitches, viruses, cyber attacks, and authorized access or data corruption. Adequate data backup and security measures are essential to protect against this risk risks. Robust security measures are necessary. Technological obsolescence. Digital formats and storage technologies can become obsolete over time, potentially leading to data loss if not properly maintained and migrated. Legal and compliance consideration. Organizations may need to comply with data protection and retention regulations when using electronic storage. So, it's important to note that the advantages and disadvantages of electronic storage can vary depending on the specific context or and needs of the user. While electronic storage offers scalability, ease of distribution, and space efficiency, it also requires careful planning to address potential challenges related to cost, accessibility, and data security. Organizations and individuals often need to strike a balance between the benefits of electronic storage and its associated consideration to effectively manage their data. In summary, both paper storage and electronic storage have the roles and advantages in data storage. Paper storage provides tangibility and security, but may be less efficient and more susceptible to physical damage. Electronic storage offers accessibility, space efficiency, and data redundancy, but requires careful attention to security and data preservation. The choice between these two storage forms often depends on the specific needs, regulations, and preference of the, or the preference of the organization or individual. In many cases, a combination of both paper and electronic storage may be employed to meet diverse storage requirements. Next, we move to choosing a statistical software package. When choosing a statistical software package for research, researchers should carefully consider several key factors 
to ensure they select the most appropriate tool for their specific needs. These factors include, so the first factor is characteristics of the data. And under characteristics of the data, we have data type. Consider whether your data is structured, e.g. tabular data, and structured, e.g. text or images, or a mixture of both, a mix of both. Some statistical software packages are better suited for specific data types. You have data size. Assess the volume of data you will be working with. Large data sets may require software capable of handling big data analytics. Data complexity. Evaluate the complexity of your data, including the number of variables, levels, or dimensions. Certain software may be better equipped for complex data structures. Data distribution. Determine whether your data follows a specific distribution, e.g. normal or binomial, as this may influence the choice of statistical tests. The second factor is analysis to be performed. Under this, we have specific statistical tests. Identify the statistical test and analysis you plan to conduct a regression analysis, hypothesis testing, clustering, time series analysis, among others. Ensure that the software supports the specific methods required for your research. Customization. Assess whether the software allows for customization and scripting, enabling you to implement specialized or custom statistical analysis. The third factor is technical constraints. Is of use. Consider your level of familiarity with statistical software. Choose a package with a user interface that matches your expertise, whether you're a beginner or an advanced user. Compatibility. Check if the software is compatible, compatible with your operating system, e.g. Windows, Mac, Linux, and hardware. Scalability. Determine if the software can handle the size of your data set and whether it can scale to accommodate future data growth. Computational resources. Assess the hardware and computational resources, e.g. CPU, RAM, required to run the software efficiently, especially for resource-intensive analysis. The fourth factor is financial constraints, costs. Evaluate the cost of licensing or subscribing to the software, considering your budget constraints. Some software packages offer free or open source alternatives. Maintenance costs. Account for ongoing maintenance and support costs, which can vary among software providers. Student or academic discounts. If you're a student or affiliated with an academic institution, require inquire about available discounts or free access to academic versions of statistical software. The fifth is user community and support. User community. Research whether the software has an active user community or online forums where you can seek help, share insights, and find resources. Technical, technical support. Investigate the availability and quality of technical support, including documentation, tutorials, and customer support channels. Data security and privacy. Ensure that the software complies with the data security and privacy regulations, especially if you're working with sensitive or confidential data. Integration with other tools. Consider whether the software integrates with other tools or data management platforms you use, such as data visualization software or databases. Long-term viability. Assess the software's long-term viability, including its history, updates, and the reputation of the software provider. You definitely want a software that will remain supported and updated over time. Trial periods and demos. Take advantage of trial periods or demos offered by software providers to test the software's suitability for your research before making a commitment. By carefully considering these factors, researchers can make an informed decision when selecting a statistical software package that best aligns with the research objectives, data characteristics, technical capabilities, and budget constraints. We move to types of statistical software packages. For data documentation and basic organization, the researcher can use 
Word processors, e.g. Microsoft Word, Excel, Google Docs, data documentation. Researchers can use word processors to create data documentation such as research protocols, code books, data dictionaries, and research reports. These documents help organize and describe the research process and findings. Advantages of the word processors. Document creation. It can easily create research protocols, code books, data dictionaries, and research reports. Text formatting. Provides rich text formatting and document structuring options. Collaboration. Supports collaborative writing and editing, allowing multiple researchers to work on the same document simultaneously. Access accessibility. Widely available and easy to use, making it accessible to most researchers. Spell check and grammar. Includes built-in spell check and grammar checking tools. Disadvantages of word processors. Limited data analysis. Not designed, for, not designed for data analysis, primarily used for text-based documentation. Data storage, limited for storing and managing large data sets. Lack of advanced statistical tools, lack of advanced statistical tools and data, data manipulation. Spreadsheets, e.g. Microsoft Excel, Google Sheets, data entry and storage. There is for data entry and storage. Spreadsheets are commonly used for data entry and storage. Researchers can organize their data into structured tables, perform basic calculations, and use formulas to pre-process and clean data. Advantages of spreadsheets. Data entry and storage. It's efficient for data entry, storage, and basic data manipulation. Calculation and formulas allows for mathematical Calculations and formula-based data transformations. Graphs and charts. Provides basic charting and graphing capabilities for data visualization. Data validation. Offers data validation roles to ensure data accuracy. Easy to learn. Relatively easy for beginners to learn and use. Disadvantages of spreadsheets. Limited data handling. May not handle very large data set efficiently. Limited st statistical analysis. Lacks advanced statistical analysis tools that may require add-ins or external software. Data integrity. Susceptible to data entry errors and cell-based data may become disorganized. Databases, e.g. Microsoft Access, MySQL, PostgreSQL. It is used for data management. Databases are particularly useful for managing large data sets efficiently. Researchers can create databases to store, retrieve, and organize data. Databases offer features like data validation, indexing, and relationships between tables. Advantages of databases, efficient data management, designed for efficient storage and management for large data sets, data relationships, Supports the establishment of relationships between different data tables. Data validation. Offers data validation and liquidity constraints. Data security. Provides user access control and security features. Scalability. Can handle significant data growth. Disadvantages. Learning curve. Requires some level of database management knowledge and expertise. Costs. Commercial database systems may incur licensing and maintenance costs. Complexity. Building and maintaining databases can be complex for beginners. We move to graphical systems, e.g. Tableau, R, Python, with Matplotlib, or Seaborn. They are used for data visualization. Graphical systems are essential for creating visual representations of data such as charts, graphs, and plots. Data visualization helps such as explore data patterns, communicate findings, and make data-driven decisions. Advantages of graphical systems.
There is for data visualization enables the creation of interactive and informative visualizations in graphs. Advanced analysis offers advanced statistical and data analysis capabilities. Customization allows for customization of visualizations and analysis scripts. Scripting supports scripting and automation of data analysis process. Community support often has active user communities and ex extensive online resources. We move to its disadvantages. Learning curve. Some graphical systems may have a steeper learning curve, particularly for advanced analysis. Technical requirements may require specific technical skills and hardware resources. Cost. Commercial software like Tableau may, be, may have sub subscription costs. Complexity of simple tests. Overkill. For simple data organization or basic tasks. The choice of software should align with your specific research objectives, data characteristics, technical skills, and budget constraints. In practice, researchers often use a combination of these software types to address different aspects of data organization, analysis, and reporting in their research projects. For complex projects, you could use this type of software tools and packages. Uh, for general purpose statistical software, we start with R, an open source statistical programming language and environment. R offers a vast array of packages for statistical analysis, data manipulation, and visualization. Uh, it is highly customizable and widely used in academic and research settings. Advantages of R um it's open source r is free to use making it accessible to researchers with budget constraints vast package library offers a wide range of packages for various statistical analysis customizability highly customizable allowing researchers to create tailored analysis and visualization active community benefits from an active and supportive user community disadvantages can be the learning curve may have a steep learning curve, especially for those new to programming. Pa performance, large data sets or complex computations can be slower in R. Limited graphical user interface. While GUIs or R Studio exist, R is primarily command line based, which may not suit all users. Another one is IBM SPSS statistics known for its user friendliness interface. SPSS is used extensively in social sciences, marketing research, and business analytics. It provides a wide range of statistical procedures and data management tools. Advantages can be user-friendly, known for its user-friendly interface, making it accessible to users with minimal statistical expertise. Broad usage, widely used in various fields, including social sciences and businesses. Rich output provides comprehensive output reports facilitating result interpretation, disadvantages, cost, commercial software with licensing fees, which can be expensive, less customization, may not be as customizable as open source alternatives, limited extensibility, less support for scripting and automation compared to R or Python, etc. A uh, statistical software package often used in economic, social sciences, and epidemiology. It offers a range of data analysis and management features. Advantages of data are data management, strong data management capabilities, including data cleaning and organization. Ease of learning, known for its ease of learning, making it suitable for beginners. Reproducibility, supports, supports reproducible research through command scripting. Uh, disadvantages can be requires for purchasing licenses, which can be costly, has fewer packages and customization options compared to R, smaller user community compared to R in Python. So you have a SAS is a versatile software suite widely used in various fields, including healthcare, finance, and data analytics. It is known for its robust data management capabilities, advantages, facility. Versatility or versatility. Okay, I don't know that spelling, sorry. Used in various industries, including healthcare, finance, and data analytics, data management, robust data management features for large data sets. Scalability scales well in to handle large data volumes and complex analysis. 
disadvantages cost sas is a commercial software with highly licensing with high licensing and maintenance cost complexity learning curve can be steep particularly for beginners proprietary closed source software limiting customization data visualization tools we have tableau i don't know okay in french it's like tableau so i hope it's just the same in english while primarily a data visualization tool, Tableau can be used for data organization and exploration, especially when dealing with large data sets. It's popular in business intelligence and research. Advantages of data visualization tools. Offers powerful data visualization capabilities with an ease to use interface. Interactive dashboards. Enables the creation of interactive and shareable dashboards. Large community benefits from a large and active user community. Disadvantages can be commercial software with subscription keys, like you have to pay for subscription fees. Limited data analysis focused primarily on visualization and may require integration with other tools for in-depth analysis. Uh, we move to Microsoft Power BI, a business analytics tool that enables data visualization and sharing it is useful for researchers who need to create interactive reports and dashboards advantages of microsoft microsoft power bi integration seamless integrates seamlessly integrates with microsoft products and services user friendliness offers an in intuitive interface for creating reports and dashboards collaboration supports collaboration and sharing of interactive Reports disadvantages can be requires licensing with costs associated with advanced features, limited advanced analytics. While great for visualization, it may lack advanced statistical analysis capabilities. Specialized research software. We have the three of them, and Vivo designed for quality data analysis is widely used in social sciences and qualitative research to organize and an analyze unstructured data such as text and audio. Uh, Mark QDA, another qualitative data analysis software used in social sciences and humanities research for coding and organizing textual data. Uh, Atlas TI focuses on qualitative research and content analysis, aiding in aiding researchers in organizing and interpreting textual and multimedia data. So the three are under specialized research software. Advantages of the three can be qualitative analysis, designed specifically for qualitative data analysis, allows for coding and organizing textual and multimedia data, then research focus, tailored for social sciences and qualitative research. Disadvantages of the three can be commercial software with licensing fees, they have licensing fees that you're charged, uh, niche use, specialized for qualitative research, may not cover quantitative analysis needs, bioinformatics and genome genomics software bioconductor an open source project for the analysis and comprehension of high throughput genomic data it is essential in bioinformatics research genius genius <laughs> a software platform for bioinformatics and data sequence analysis often used in genetics and molecular biology research advantages of bioconductor and genius bioinformatics tools Tailored for high throughput genomic data analysis, community support, bioconductor benefits from an active community. Disadvantages of bioconducting junior specialized, primarily suited for bioinformatics and genomics research, learning curve requires domain specific knowledge for, specific, for effective use. Then we go to geospatial and mapping software. ArcGIS. What are used in geography, environmental science, in urban planning, research for geospatial data organization analysis and mapping? QGIS, an open source geographic information system, software that provides mapping and spatial data analysis capabilities. Uh, advantages can be geospatial analysis, ideal for geospatial data organization analysis and mapping customization, offers customization through scripting and plugins, Community, QGIS benefits from an active open source community disadvantages. Cost, ArcGIS is commercial software with licensing fees. Learning curve, geographic information system software can be complex for beginners. Yes. 
machine learning and data science tools. We have Python. While not exclusively a statistical software, Python is widely used in data science and machine learning research. Libraries like NumPy, Pandas, and Kikitlan offer robust data analysis and modeling capabilities. We have Jupyter Notebook, an interactive com computing environment used for data analysis, visualization, and machine learning, often in combination with Python. Advantages, versi versatility. Python is a general purpose programming language widely used for data science and machine learning community. Python has a large and active data science community integration. Jupyter Notebook allows for interactive data analysis and code sharing. Disadvantages, learning curve. Python and Jupyter may have a learning curve for those new to programming. Resource intensive, complex machine learning tasks may require significant computational Resources. Each software type has its strengths and weaknesses, and the choice depends on the specific research objectives, data types, budget, and researchers' familiarity with the software. Researchers often use a combination of these tools to address different aspects of their research projects. The researcher should brainstorm on the following before purchasing any statistical software package. Data storage and accessibility. How will the data collected be stored? Determine where and how the research, research data will be stored, whether it's in databases, spreadsheets, or other formats. How will the data be assess, accessed by the software package? Ensure that the software can in, interface with the chosen data storage method. It may involve importing data into the software or connecting directly to databases. We have to check on data manipulation. Uh, under data manipulation, the things you're supposed to take note are Will the statistical package be able to create new variables? Confirm that the software allows for data manipulation, including the creation of new variables, data transformation, and cleaning. Can the software query the data? Verify that the software supports querying data to extract specific subsets of information for analysis. Data volume and size. What amount of data will be used for the analysis? Determine the size and the complexity of your data set to ensure that the software can handle it effectively. Will the statistical package be able to handle the database size? Assess whether the software can accommodate the expected volume of data without performance issues. Self knowledge and training. Does the current staff have the knowledge to operate the statistical package? Evaluate the expertise of your team. Consider whether training will be required to effectively use the software. Financial implications. What is the financial implication of the statistical package? Calculate the total cost of ownership, including licensing, subscription fees, maintenance, and training costs. Consider your budget constraints and resources. Scalability and future needs. Is the software scalable? Consider whether the software can accommodate potential future data growth and evolving research needs. Integration with existing tools. Does the software integrate with other tools or systems you use? Ensure compatibility with existing data management, visualization, or reporting tools. Support and updates. What level of support and updates does the software provider offer? Ensure that you have access to technical support, documentation, and software updates. Licensing and compliance. Are there any licensing restrictions or compliance issues to consider? Ensure that the software complies with any legal or ethical requirements associated with your research, especially if it involves sensitive data, user, community, and resources. Is there an active user community for the software. A strong user community can provide valuable resources, forums for troubleshooting and user-generated content. By thoroughly addressing these considerations, researchers can make an informed decision when purchasing a statistical software package that aligns with the research objectives, data management needs, technical capabilities, and budget constraints. It's essential to conduct a comprehensive assessment to avoid potential challenges and ensure a smooth research process. So guys, we have covered an entire topic uh, about data organization. We've tackled each and every data, given examples, given advantages and disadvantages. If you learned something, please comment below, like, share, comment, and subscribe to the channel. See you in the next video. Bye.